Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. If we can have all of the committee members have their cameras on, we are going to go ahead and start with the February 28th Heritage Committee meeting. We are going to start this evening's meeting with the election of the chair and vice chair. So if we can go ahead and have any nominations for chair, if you'd like to nominate somebody, you can unmute, raise your hand, and let us know uh, who you're looking to nominate. Councilor McCurry, go ahead. Uh, Lisa, thank you very much. I would like to nominate uh, Nathan Edrington for uh, chair position. Nathan, do you accept the nomination? Yes. Are there any other nominations? Councilor Wall, I see you had your hand up there. No? No, it's for vice chair. Okay, uh, we'll go ahead then with uh, nominations for vice chair. Councilor Wall. Tamara Coley. Tamara, do you accept the nomination? Yes, thank you. Are there any other nominations for vice chair? Okay, so seeing none, before we continue, uh, we do have to do a vote uh, for Nathan's role as chair because he has served uh, two consecutive one-year terms as a chair. We do have to vote um, on his uh, chair. So the vote will need to be un unanimous. Councillor McCurry, go ahead. Lisa, I, I think we have to waive the rules. I would move that we waive the section 15 rules to permit Mr. Etherington to serve two consecutive terms, seeking a seconder from Councillor Wall. And like I mentioned, that vote will have to be unanimous. So all those in favor? Not seeing any opposed, that carries. Nathan, do you have the role, uh, the chair, the roadmap in front of you? Yeah. Excellent. Okay, I will hand things off to you then. Go ahead. Okay, thank you. So uh, I now call the meeting to order. Uh, the roll call has been taken by the clerk, and I would like to remind the committee, staff, and our viewing public of the electronic participation policy for virtual meetings. The full corporate policy 50 regarding electronic and virtual meetings is available online to review. Staff and delegates are reminded to keep their video and microphones muted or microphones off until requested by the chair or members of the committee. All cameras for committee members shall remain on to ensure quorum is achieved. In the event of a connection, or service interruption that affects quorum, we may recess the meeting for up to 15 minutes to regain quorum. If quorum is not achieved, the meeting will be adjourned. All rules for delegations under the city's procedural bylaw will continue to apply, and all members of the committee participating via online video conference will vote by physical show of hands. The chair will indicate to leave your hand raised until they have determined the result of the vote. So with that, we'll move on to item three, declarations of conflicts of interest. Does anyone have any conflicts that they need to declare? Seeing none, I'll move on. There are no uh, presentations or delegations. So we'll move on to item five and 5.1 for the heritage impact assessment for 130 Elgin Street. I will ask Douglas Stewart and Amy Barnes to provide an overview of the uh, assessment. I remind you, you have 15 minutes uh, to present inclusive of the uh, questions. So I'll hand the floor over to you. Thank you. If I could just start and I'll keep my comments as brief as possible. And to all, the intent here is there's an existing building we wish to make use of for future residential and to provide for that we needed an amendment to the bylaw and a future site plan as part of the review of, of the proposed amendment for the before the for the bylaw with a heritage impact assessment it was it was it was completed, so I now 
that's the that's the reason we are here. So thanks, Douglas. My name is Amy Barnes. Uh, thank you, chair and committee members and staff for allowing us to speak. I'm going to give you a very quick overview of the uh, the HIA. However, I, I'm going to be very quick so to leave time for questions, as I'm sure you've all read it. So the property in question is 130 Elgin Street. <clears throat> it's also formerly known as the St. Luke's Anglican Church. So it is the church on the corner there. It is not designated uh, or recognized currently under the Ontario Heritage Act. And what triggered this was uh, that it's considered, it's on the, it's a candidate on the list for, on the city's heritage register. So with that in place, they were at, we were asked to do an HIA to examine its cultural heritage value or interest, which we did in the report. So an assessment of 906, uh, with, with in order to provide an impact assessment, we came up with a statement of significance and the associated heritage attributes, and then looked at that against the, the proposed impact. So we have both, um, we, we went through quite a um, historical review, so I'm sure you all saw that and probably appreciated. I thought there were some really interesting pieces there. Um, but when we get down to the actual impact assessment, we did uh, look at it, its changing of use. Now this is already a deconsecrated church, so, so that is an important piece of information to understand there. Um, and then the proposed impacts were about the removal of the Lancet windows. I'd really like to make this clear, this is not changing the, the window openings, this is just the windows themselves. So the, the Lancet window style, which is common to the Gothic Revival, will remain there. It's just the windows themselves. And then the creation of new openings to allow for doorways. So on the, on the side elevations and at the very back, so east and north elevations. Um, and then also the proposed uh, change in land use. There's also some really good positive impacts here too, which I felt was worthy of acknowledging. So the continued use of a building in an adaptive reuse form is always encouraged in terms of heritage conservation and best practices. Um, churches right now, it's, it's a very, it's, are, can be challenging sometimes because uh, there's a lot more that are becoming um, available and open. So this is a provide an ongoing use. Um, also, there's going to be quite a few elements that are going to be repaired as part of this. So the rotting floors, some are just completely gone in areas. Um, obviously, just with with the adaptive reuse, you just get some inherent structural maintenance and things along those lines that come with with rehabilitating it into um, into a new uh, residential area. And then the reinstatement of the two lancet windows at the back, which are form which are were formerly windows but have since been bricked in. So their intent is to be reopened and remade into windows to to allow for those openings to be there again. Um, our conservation measures were simply just were, were, were kind of just recommendations and suggestions as well as, as well as some recommend sorry some recommendations and some things that are encouraged knowing that this is not a designated property nor is it officially listed. So we really focused on if it was a candidate for listing when you're looking at listing you're really just looking at what's being removed what's being kind of demolished. So we focused it on that. Obviously, uh, repairing the existing windows is encouraged, but, but really the window openings and the structural openings um, is, is a really key part to ensuring that the, its legibility and readability as a Gothic church remains. So, so we encourage the reuse. However, that's not feasible. We've asked for replacement windows, which match the appearance and proportion um, and character of those former windows. The salvage and reuse of brick when you're when they're taking out the brick to reopen the area uh, to, to allow for those openings to be salvaged to use for repair in the future um, is just you know like materials with like materials will always um, help with with long term maintenance. Retain in situ is obviously not going to be a problem uh, because it retains its legibility as a, a place of worship and then some of the embedded hardware. Um, we, we asked to either be remain in place and if it is to be removed to be given back to the church. Now the church has already taken um, from it what they have uh, deemed as being of significance to them. So these are plaques that are right into the wall. It's my understanding there's no intention of removing those. However, if it should in the future, uh, we just ask that they're given back as a courtesy. And then a salvage of materials that are, uh, that are available. And I'll leave it there and, and just open it up to any questions if anyone has any. Yeah, thank you for your presentation. Does anyone have any uh, questions for the presenters? 
No? Okay, I have some. So I'll, <laughs> I'll use up some of this time. Um, the, the one it mentioned, the stained glass window uh, by the, in memory of her son that had died at the Watrous factory. So that stained glass window is gone, correct? Um, it's, it's, can you, t is it, that, is that the one at the front of the church in the, in the stairwell? I'm not sure. It's just referred okay. to in the historical section. So on page 15 of your report. Okay. I think you're speaking to the one that's, as you walk in, there is a stained glass one there, which is buckling right now. Um, in the picture, you can see that it's the, um, the leaded, uh, Lots. muttons there are, are buckling. So, uh, it's, it, it, as part of the recommendation, the idea is to remove that and and either salvage it or reintegrate it into the design. But as it stands right now, it's it's experiencing, I believe, water infiltration. I'm not an engineer, uh, but it's it's being structurally compromised there. I, yep. I'm not sure that really answered your question, but <laughs> yeah, okay, um, yeah, that that gives me some sense. It's still there. That was. The, the main thrust of the question. Yeah, if it's the one I'm thinking of, um, I, I believe so, yes. Yeah. Um, and then- I'll check my photos right now if, you would, if you'd like me to, to absolutely clarify. No, it's okay. Um, the other question I had was, you mentioned uh, plaques. So there's a number of plaques that are remaining, but a bunch of them have, were taken out by the church beforehand, right? Correct. So on the interior at the very kind of back, like where would be the back of the space there, there are two plaques which are embedded into the wall. I'm just trying to see if I have uh, included a picture there. Um, but they are, they are fastened right into the wall. So not easily removable. Um, and, and, you know, the, the idea is not to remove them to keep them in place because it's, it's, unknown kind of how they're they're fastened in there and built around there so the idea was that should in the future they need to be removed for any reason that they be given back to the this the churches or, or offered back but right now there's no intention to to remove them so we have a places of worship subcommittee uh that okay. formed because of a number of these churches that were closing and in one of the churches before anything went out, we were able to go in and inventory all of the plaques in the church okay. so that we were aware of what plaques were there and if there were any that were important to the uh, community. So um, I, I don't know, you mentioned that the, that the um, congregation took a number of them. So mm -hmm. a, a complete inventory could not be done, but um, an inventory of some of those plaques yeah, you know, where they are in situ might also be helpful. Okay, I, 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 some of them are documented within the report, but I certainly could provide you with, it could be provided if needed, uh, an outline of where they are. There's just two in the back in the interior. And then on image 15, 14 and 15 of the report are the ones on the exterior. So the overview and then the close up of them. Okay, perfect, thank you. Okay, um, so with that, um, we'll go on to uh, a motion for comments. So I would need a mover and a seconder for comments. If we have comments that we want to add. Does anyone want to add any comments? Maybe I should ask that first. No, everyone's happy? Okay. All right then. So uh, I think the last time this happened, we didn't even have to vote on anything. Correct? Oh, Rob, maybe Rob has to say that. Thank you. Uh, just to uh... A comment. <clears throat> I only received this report earlier today, and I haven't had a chance to review it. And it's it's quite lengthy and and detailed. So I don't know if if my situation is unique or not. But I really don't feel 
comfortable on making comments on a report that I really haven't had a chance to review yet. Okay. Thank you for sharing that. Um. So, uh, Nathan. Yeah. I will uh, acknowledge that there was some delay in providing this uh, agenda. So I know some people didn't get it until earlier today. So perhaps uh, the committee would want to uh, move that this item be deferred for one cycle to have time to review it. And then we can make a, a have some time to provide comments. I see Patrick is on here. Perhaps he has some insight here. Yeah, so through the chair, so the heritage impact assessment that's before the committee is part of a complete application. So it is a public matter. If there's no comments from the committee at this time, the committee could move just to receive the report. And then any members who have comments can provide those, provide their comments individually to staff. Uh, that would allow some more time to review the report. Uh, I wanted to review at their own pace, their own schedule, and then provide those comments for consideration back to staff, but they'll just be provided as individual comments. Yeah, okay. Um, when would you need that by, Patrick? Uh, I think if within two weeks. Okay. And if it's received, uh, I can confer with the planner on file, see if that time frame works. And then if not, I can follow up with the committee and provide a new time frame. But okay. this would allow the committee members to review the document, review the, the study, and provide those comments with uh, seeing uh, not many concerns or comments raised without holding up the, the development application. Yeah. Um, before I acknowledge Council Rob, does that work for you? Are you able to do that within two weeks? I could have a, I could have a look at it. Who would the comments be provided to? Patrick. Yeah, that works for you, Rob? Yeah. Yes. Okay, perfect. Uh, Councilor Wall. Yeah, that's it. Um, essentially what Patrick said, I don't, I don't see any reason we should hold these folks up unless we have serious objections to it. Um, the report's pretty straightforward. Um, I know that Rob didn't get a chance to read it and I'm certain he'll be able to provide his commentary, but I do believe other people did have a chance to read the report on the committee. Same. I, I just don't see any reason to hold it up unless there's a major objection from a member of this committee regarding anything that's in the report. So, so you're, are, are you moving to receive it then? If there's no other speakers in the queue, I see Doug has his hand, Douglas, sorry has his hand up. I'd love to hear what he has to say. Doug, may I call on Douglas? Yeah, go ahead, Doug. If I may reply back through the chair, if the next two weeks is required to give response from those of, the, of, the, of this group, that is acceptable. Okay, thank you. Uh, so, so Councillor Wall, I believe now has moved to receive this. Does council will have a seconder? And uh, Susan. Uh, so any discussion on that? So we're moving to receive it. And if you have additional comments, email them to Patrick within two weeks. Everyone clear on what we're voting on? Yeah, Council Wall, did you have something to add before we vote? Yeah, Rod. Rob asked a question and I wasn't, I didn't hear the answer to the question. Who are these comments to be received by? You, you send them to Patrick and then Patrick will receive them and coordinate them. To present them to whom? Who are, who are these comments for? These comments get forwarded to council. And, okay, that's what I, so there's an opportunity if there were any, okay. I, all right, but thank you. Yeah, okay. I'm gonna call the question then. All those in favor? Uh, point of order. Councilor oh. McCurry has his hand up, sir. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I couldn't see that. It was disguised in there in the little door in his background picture. Sorry. It's hiding. That. It's hiding in the old police station, Mr. Chair. Uh, my hand is, and it's flesh colored, so it's difficult to see. I just wanna say that um, it's refreshing to see this come forward and we've got a developer here that's um, 
respectful of uh, Bradford's heritage and the reuse of this building. Uh, lots of good things to say. I will say to committee that we'll ensure that um, uh, we don't have a repeat of the, the agenda landing on our desks um, uh, on the day of the meeting, okay? Yeah. Okay, so uh, I'm gonna call the question then on receiving this. All those in favor? Thank you, hands down, I declare it carried. Okay, we will move on to 5.2, which is a proposed alteration to 10 Brand Ave or Jubilee Terrace Park, a property designated under Park 4 of the Ontario Heritage Act. I would invite uh, Dave Zimmer and Hannah Abdullah from Parks uh, and Development Office to come forward and provide an overview of this item. Okay, good evening, everybody. Um, is there a, um, I have a copy of the plan I could share or does everybody have an image of the uh, proposed concept? Or do you have a copy of it? There we go, perfect. So this is uh, the proposed concept for um, redevelopment of the uh, Jubilee Terrace. And a couple of highlights um, that I'll quickly go over here is one of the things that we try to do or that we have done with this concept is to prove ex improve accessibility. So um, as it stands right now, the cannon sits in a, on a concrete pad in the middle of the grass and it is unaccessible for all users, especially those um, that use mobility devices or that are handicapped or physically challenged. So one of the things that we've done here is we're providing uh, improved connections from Brant Ave into the site and to the uh, promenade slash terrace that uh, is along the uh, top of the bank. That, that also improves the access. Um, you can see uh, towards the bottom of the concept, um, there are actually three access points into the site and all will be improved. Um, what we've done also is we've enlarged the area for the cannon. So now, um, somebody in a mobility device could in fact get onto that uh, the plaza area um, and they will be able to maneuver around the cannon. Um, you can see there the memorial stone. So we've ensured that there is adequate space for uh, wheelchair turning um, and um, multiple users on the uh, pad at one time. We've also provided uh, in terms of aesthetics, we've uh, improved the planting that backs onto the uh, armory. We've uh, provided opportunities for seating so that people could sit out and look uh, out towards the uh, cannon area into the lawn um, and out into Colburn Street as well. Uh, and then there is uh, optional um, space for a future memorial site there you can see. so. Um, what we've done is we've tried to balance the, the size of the site with, um, you know, the requirements for uh, new siting of the cannon and potential future um, access. So, um, and then including some additional planting beds um, that will highlight and um, again, provide more aesthetics for the cannon area. It's a small site, so um, you know I think we've done a fairly decent job of trying to maintain a balance between accessibility, aesthetics, and function on the site. Uh, along the uh, promenade, uh, you can see we've got a new bench. All that will be cleaned up. All the existing concrete unit pavers um, will be replaced with concrete, so it's all concrete uh, paving around the whole site, so there are no issues with accessibilities or trip hazards or anything. All the furnishings will be the new downtown um, heritage style furniture, the black uh, powder coated furnishings with new trash receptacles. And we also have an opportunity there for uh, an, a new interpretive sign um, yet to be designed um, so that uh, you, we can either celebrate uh, more description of the canyon or the river or whatever. So all in all, it's a, it's a very nice um, little improvement to a key um, spot, um, a junction along the a step off point onto the river at a uh, major intersection in downtown. So 
our plan is to, um, we've been in contact with uh, Sarah Monroe to get, I understand that the cannon needs some refurbishment. Uh, we've been in touch with her to get the cannon removed. We would like to uh, proceed with, we've got working drawings completed. We would like to proceed to purchasing uh, so that we can tender this and get the construction underway in early spring so that uh, we anticipate uh, the outside worst case scenario would be a couple of months of construction. Uh, but then we would have it uh, completed hopefully sometime um, end of June into July, this uh, site would be completed. So um, that's it in a nutshell, basically. So I don't know if there's any questions or uh, comments or concerns that anybody has. Okay, uh, any questions for the presenters quickly before we go ahead, Beth? Uh, just wondering, Dave, if you have any sense as to what you think the space that's uh, outlined for a possible future memorial, would, what would it be used for? Do you have any um, thoughts? Well, at this point, um, some of the discussions that the working group um, working with the um, the regiment. I, I and sorry, I, the, the fellow's name escapes me. Council McCreary probably uh, could uh, provide that information. But uh, one of the things was sort of a, a memorial wall, um, and in what shape or form that takes, we don't know. Um, we were thinking that it would be some kind of um, wall with um, interpretive information on it, names of the fallen or whatever. So really, we don't know. It wouldn't be a major piece, but it would, it provides an opportunity to, um, you know, provide more, more information, more, you know, more, uh, yeah, more information on, you know, the canon or, or whatever, or to be determined yet. So, um, or could, if, if that doesn't happen, like it, it's not, necessary for this design but it it's a, it's provides an opportunity but in the meantime um we've got a, a nice resized plaza area um you know where people could congregate and just in, enjoy it's a nice sunny spot lots of action you know like um that's what we were thinking in the in the interim does that answer your question there beth yeah i just that's a a very wise uh, thought to have just because in the past we have had conversations about uh, different groups wanting to uh, add to the existing memorials where it's not suitable. So by having this additional space available, it's uh, very forward in thinking. So thank you. And I, I believe Council Mercer is probably going to add on to that now. I see other hands as well. Uh, sure, thank you. Yes, I, I can offer a little, a little more background as Mr. Zimmer alluded to. Uh, the design was one of two or three uh, that were uh, commissioned by, uh, from Park staff rather, by the, uh, the uh, committee that dealt with the restoration of the gun and uh, is, is now looking at broader aspects of the war memorial uh, vicinity. Um, it was the favored um, design uh, picked by the committee and by staff um, the memorial to which Mr. Zimmer has spoken uh, is something that uh, the Colonel, Colonel Hatfield, um, is interested in pursuing, and it would be a memorial, um, probably, probably concrete, rock, granite, uh, something like that, as, as, as Dave said, that would, would have some lettering on it. And the intention of the Colonel is to recognize the World War I contribution of 56 Field Regiment and its affiliated um, uh, groups that, that fought at the time. Uh, and it would relate, I think, uh, to, to some degree to the action um, uh, that resulted in the award of the gun to the city of Brantford as a war trophy. Uh, and one of, the, one of the motivating reasons for the redevelopment of this park is that folks really don't recognize it as a city park and they don't use it. There's a couple of benches that face the river, uh, but I think it's, it's largely held by, by common opinion that it belongs to the armory and um, explaining why you seldom ever see anybody there. So it's going to better define that it's a municipal space. It's going to better connect to the, you know, to the, 
the trail accesses and um, it's going to be um, a real a real benefit and, and, and a nice addition to our uh, downtown memorial district and, and um, the center of the city mr chair thank you council mccurry um i think i saw susan's hand next and then tamara There, finally unmuted. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I did uh, want to say uh, absolutely that it looks like the design has been optimized. It uh, is a very good design. Just um, a question to the park staff. Uh, I see that there are no ramps, so I'm assuming that there is no change in grade that would constitute a ramp required anywhere. There are uh, three, four steps that I see to the south. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. And no ramps required. Right. So the... Um... The, the budget for this project um, actually didn't allow us to redevelop those existing stairs. So what we did is we focused, and, and those stairs actually lead, as you probably know, to, to the back of the armory and to the back alleyway. Um, what we focused on is providing pedestrian access from the main uh, thoroughfares. So there are no ramps. Uh, minimal grades from Brant Ave, Colburn Street. So in our opinion, that's the, the primary way into the site. Um, it doesn't mean that at a later date, um, as funds become available, we, we've also looked at um, this design hasn't precluded the development of any um, stairs or, or ramp configuration as it leads back behind the armory. So that's yet to be determined, but in the future, that could easily be accommodated without affecting this design. But like I say, the, the main access points, um, main visibility is all from um, the uh, Colburn Street and Brant Ave. Thank you. Okay, uh, Tamara. Hi, I, yeah, sorry. Um, I guess I was just looking at the, the road right of way line and mm -hmm. just concerned that it, it went right through the middle of the monument and, and uh, but I guess budget constraints being what it is, we can't shift that one way or another without um, like at some point, I'm assuming we're gonna have to do something with that intersection or are we sort of designating this as protected lands and we can get rid of that road right away? Yeah, um, I can't answer that question. Um, Unfortunately, you know, this, this is one of the, the legacy type parks that we have, and we have a lot of those in the city where, um, you know, there were things were built within the right of ways. And, and now a lot of that is coming home to uh, haunt us when we do our work. Um, I, I would think that uh, because of the Bohr Memorial, um, that this site would be protected. Um, any work that is done on the Lorne Bridge would take into consideration the existing um, Jubilee Terrace, and um, you know this is th this is a um, it, it's a prominent site in the city, and it has well heritage value, right? It's got significance. It's uh, it represents you know a lot here. So I think that it would be uh, treated as sacred. So I I wouldn't have any concern um, with any. Uh, roadway construction or anything that that would be a, a major uh, faux pas and uh, create a major problem for us in this situation. Thanks, Dave. Um, I was, uh, yeah, that brought up a bunch of questions in my head. I have a whole bunch of photos from the past of that monument when it was an unveiled even and there was uh, considerable green space around it at that time. Mm -hmm. But uh, the road has uh, encroached quite a, quite a way. Mm -hmm. um, my one question I guess that I had, and it's very out uh, mm -hmm. kind of, um, I know that we have uh, some award winning greenhouses in the, in the city of Brantford, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't know if they 
grow poppies or would poppies be considered for around in these flower beds around the canon? Uh, they could be. Um, what we did there, those uh, flower beds um, are annuals, um, could be perennials. Um, along the um, armory side there, um, every year they're planted up with petunias and then in the fall, um, uh, the horde department comes in and they put in mums or whatever. But um, we could certainly look at that um, with perennial planting of poppies. Um, um, yeah, we're not we're not opposed. So um, we've actually left that as annual planting, but um, that that could be um, if the committee uh, desires so, or if there's changes to be made like that. That's that's easy to do. I just don't know if that the city had the capability, so to speak. Uh, they don't they don't grow poppies per se. Um, that would be a, an annual type plant or perennial planting that you know we could spec. And that would be uh, installed when we construct the garden initially, um, and then maintained therein afterwards, uh, so that it's you know um, has proper upkeep. And and this this is more along the lines of a horticultural park. So the hort staff does a pretty good job at those parks and weeding and upkeep and making sure that it looks tidy and and uh, watering. Um, unfortunately, there's no irrigation system here, but um, park staff does in, in the horticultural parks, they, they do have a watering program where they, you know, ensure that there's upkeep, especially at a high profile site like this. So, Well, thank you for coming and your presentation to us. And uh, we're excited to see these things get underway and hopefully got some improved public access here. Yeah. Well, thank you. Um, Patrick, do you have a presentation as well? Uh, through the chair, yes. Uh, there is a heritage planning staff presentation. Um, Go ahead. I'm just going to share my screen. So thank you, Chair. Uh, staff, uh, Heritage staff won't uh, go over the same design matters. I think uh, Dave Zimmer from Parks Design and Construction did an excellent job of that. Uh, we'll just focus then on the, the matter of the heritage designation and the bylaw. So the subject property is designated individually under part four. It's on Brent Avenue, but it's not part of the Heritage Conservation District. And so the bylaw gives an overview uh, some of the historic um, activities or events that, that occurred at Jubilee Terrace Park. Um, as was shown, uh, right now the alteration before the committee is a re-landscaping with new paths, uh, spotlighting, which akin to any historic signage is considered an appropriate way of lighting historic sites and monuments and signs, uh, and does not affect any of the heritage attributes of the park. Uh, so for, for the committee's information, uh, the three real heritage attributes of Jubilee Terrace Park are the Howitzer Cannon Memorial, the Boer War Memorial, and the uh, site's position and scenic views of the Grand River, the Warm Bridge. And while there are a number of historic events, uh, none of these uh, proposed alterations at the re-landscaping will have a negative impact on any of the heritage attributes. Um, they will increase the usability of the park, the ability for the public to interact with the memorials, as was mentioned during the uh, previous uh, discussion. And simply put, staff feel that the alterations are appropriate and therefore is re recommending that the committee um, approve the application. Uh, very short presentation from us, but yes, uh, it's a good alteration. It respects the character of the park and enhances its usability. So staff are in favor. Okay, thank you. Any questions for Patrick? Okay, seeing none. Uh, I think, uh, Chair, if I may, I can speak yeah. to just one of the questions that was raised earlier on the matter of uh, the right of way. As a designated property, if there is any realignment considered for the road, um, one, it would have to be considered, the property is a heritage property and would have to be considered and those attributes conserved through the environmental assessment process and the design, but 
also that alteration, that change would have to come before the Brantford Heritage Committee. So it uh, could not just be moved without this committee being made aware and some serious consideration about why the design needs to have that monument relocated. So in the short term, there is uh, no likelihood of it being moved from its present location and, and it would go through a formal thorough review should that occur. Thanks, Patrick. Um, so there is a, a recommendation that this be approved. Would someone care to make that motion? Uh, moved by Susan, seconded by Tamara. Uh, any discussion? Seeing none, I'll call the question. All those in favor? Thank you, everyone. Hands down, I declare it carried. All right, we will move on to Patrick's report on the Heyman family history and research. Uh, thank you, Chair. So I have a staff presentation in a moment. I'll just share my screen. So this staff presentation considers the matter of the Heyman family, their history and the research uh, that was conducted. So in September of 2020, council directed staff and the Brantford Heritage Committee to look into the history of the Heyman family and report back on how that family might be recognized either through a name on the street name list uh, through or through the naming of a municipal asset. Uh, in corporate policy uh, 23. That's the municipal naming policy for buildings, structures, and parks. Uh, so in the course of doing this research, staff were in contact with a descendant of the Heyman family. That was a Mr. Uh, Bichard, a Warren Bichard. He provided images such as those you can see on the screen. The history of the Heyman family in Brantford starts with uh, John Heyman and his wife, Maria Heyman. Uh, John was a veteran of the Boer War and he emigrated to Canada from England. Uh, when arriving in Brantford, he resided at a number of properties in West Brant, had a job with Massey Harris. We have a picture of the machine shop crew on this slide in uh, 1941. Um, and John Heyman uh, is seen here with the, uh, the dark vest and uh, what we've called today a newsboy cap, but quite distinctive uh, in, in the crew photo. Um, he had four, uh, John and Maria Heyman had four kids. Uh, John was the first to come and then the family came over later. Uh, after leaving West Brant, they moved to a small farm on West, uh, West Street, which was at the time in uh, the township of Brantford and just out, outside the city limits. Uh, as far as was noted, uh, John Heyman was a Boer War veteran. He fought for England in the war before coming to Canada. Um, we have uh, documentation both provided by surviving family members and uh, able to be found through federal records and even some of our own city directories. So uh, three, three, actually four generations of the Heyman family served in various conflicts or the armed forces. Uh, John Heyman himself in the Boer War, his son, William, uh, William ultimately William Sr. Uh, in the, the overalls in the black pants served in World War I. And we can find federal records that he enlisted. Uh, we have a news clip here that was provided by the family and it lists uh, that the battalions and where family members had enlisted. Uh, so William Sr. enlisted with the 215th Battalion in Brantford before uh, being uh, sent uh, overseas to England, where the battalion was sort of split up and, and assigned to other reinforcing battalions. William's son, William Jr., uh, fought in World War II, and we have a photo of him in his pilot officer uniform. And he, uh, his son, James, was uh, uh, enlisted in the Royal Canadian Navy, so we have a photo of James the uh, article referenced on the screen also speaks to another grandson of John Heyman, who was in the Air Cadets. So we do see a history of the family serving in armed forces and doing public service. Uh, 
like so many families, this family, uh, the Heyman family lived in Brantford and worked at some of the big industries that really contributed to the, the booming economy in Brantford. Um, looking through city directories from a number of years, a number of decades even, you can see references to family members uh, living and working in Brantford at firms like Slingsby, Watchress, Cockshut, uh, and Massey Harris. We also see references to some who work for the Bell Telephone Company and at uh, Brantford General Hospital. Uh, information provided by descendants of the family. Uh, one of, I believe it was William Sr.'s daughters um, actually left, we were told left school early in order to, uh, to work at Cockshut Molded Aircraft during the war. Uh, as so many women uh, took up jobs while men were overseas fighting. Uh, the request that we received the staff related uh, to the, the farm the Heyman family owned, and that was owned by John and Maria Heyman, as you noted, it was on West Street. So staff looked through a number of historic maps and aerial photos that we have and have access to. So here is the uh, 1858 remains map of Brantford. Uh, the Heyman family came to own the farm in uh, 1928, and they owned it until approximately 1965 when it was sold to Brand Woodlands Limited. So here on the 1858 map, we just see with the approximate location of the family farm. Uh, and this is what, what at the time was the Smith and Kirby brand. And we see uh, also some notes that uh, ownership of, by J.D. Clement in that area as well. Uh, 1875, again, we see some changes in ownership, uh, some slight growth in the city of Brantford um, or the town of Brantford at the time. And, Again, the approximate location of the farm is, is shown there. Uh, further development can be seen in 1927. This is just before the Heyman family would have purchased the, the, the farm on West Street. You can see uh, Brantford is expanding, uh, new neighborhoods added, some new streets, and uh, uh, more consistent development from rural areas to more urbanized. Uh, 1950, this is during the time the Heyman family would have owned the parcel. Again, we can see some development up uh, on King George Road. We see the, the, the Tranquility and Fairview names added to the topographic map. So while Bar uh, Brantford is expanding, the family retains ownership of this farm parcel and continues to work in the city, commuting down uh, or living at various other locations as uh, they grew up, had their own families, descendants lived in, in Brantford. Uh, this is an aerial photo from 1967, so shortly after the farm was officially sold by uh, Maria Heyman. Um, she survived uh, her husband's passing. Uh, we can see the Grand Woodlands neighborhood start to be developed here. We can see Baxter Street uh, with houses constructed on one side. Um, the yellow outline is the approximate boundaries of the Heyman family farm. So it was on West Street. Uh, near what is today the 403 and uh, contains a small wood lot, a laneway to West Street, uh, but generally is a distinct square shape. And we can see these, uh, this tree line or hedge line maintained. So in 1980, the Grand Woodlands neighborhood is fully built out, but again, we see a portion of the Heyman family farm. It's actually um, retained in Grand Woodlands Park, the tree line, um, continues from, from the ownership of the Heyman family into the present day. Uh, the other parts of the property, however, were um, parceled off and, and developed into the, the cul-de-sacs, the streets, sold off as lots. Uh, so this is a more modern current aerial photo, I think circa 2017, based on what we have available on our internal mapping. This was prepared by the city surveyor and it shows the uh, boundaries of the Heyman family farm overlaid with the present, the neighborhood in the present day. And as can be seen on the left edge of the image, there's a woodlot. Some of those trees are newer, but forestry staff have visited the site and are able to, uh, they're of the opinion that certain trees are certainly uh, mature enough as to have dated to the time of the Heyman family. Uh, what this shows is that, uh, you know, there's a tangible link from the time the Heyman family lived and farmed on the land and now to the present day, uh, these are mature trees which have 
uh, been enjoyed by residents in the neighborhood. They've contributed to the character, uh, the feel of the park. So we do see that tangible link. So options put forward in, in council's direction to staff were to consider street naming or facilities naming. Uh, so through a previous project, uh, the planning department has long maintained a list of approved street names. Uh, a recent review and creation of a formal street naming policy, Corporate 48, uh, had staff looking through uh, the, the Album of Honor, uh, the Great War Centenary Association, and other community groups um, and, and uh, commemorative spaces, Prominence Point, and in this case, the, uh, the uh, Sports Hall of Recognition. Within the Sports Hall, we uh, pulled the name Heyman from uh, the entry for Edith Heyman. Uh, she was recognized for her badminton career, uh, received Olympic medals to recognize her coaching and established clubs uh, in Brantford and I believe in Ottawa as well. Uh, she was a tireless booster of the sport of badminton. So staff already added and went to council and recommended the name Heyman be included in the list of approved street names. And in this case, it's recognizing the accomplishments of Edith Heyman. Uh, so staff are not recommending that that be changed to recognize the family. Uh, an appropriate way to recognize the family in this case may be something more geographically um, coordinated to the land they owned. Um, unfortunately, uh, the renaming of streets is a very tricky thing. It has impacts on first responders, on businesses, on residents, because addresses are used to identify properties. So at this time, staff won't be recommending that the Heyman family be recognized collectively through the municipal street naming policy. But in future, after um, line of duty losses from um, World War I, World War II, the Korean War, and uh, emergency first responders, we will get into the priority three street name lists, which include the Edith Heyman. Another policy to consider for, for naming was the municipal naming policy for buildings, for structures, and parks. So there were two streams of commemoration uh, that are set out in this policy. One is the renaming of the entire municipal asset. That would be the, the park in this case. Um, what our research showed is that the park actually consists of land from a number of historic farms and so owned by a number of families as part of the Smith and Kirby tract went through a number of ownership changes before it became uh, the Heyman family farm. Uh, and what was incorporated today or into the park that exists today, only a portion of that park belonged to the Heyman family. Um, similar to the street naming policy, the municipal naming policy for buildings, you know, structures and parks, generally recommends against the renaming of municipal assets. That honor is supposed to be permanent until that asset is decommissioned. Another option for recognition under that policy, however, is a commemorative bench, tree, or plaque program. So uh, plaques can be purchased and installed to commemorate events, local history or character. Uh, staff will be recommending that the, the, the commemorative bench, tree, or plaque programs be used to potentially commemorate the Heyman family and their time spent uh, in the area, their contributions to Brantford. It's something that staff uh, will recommend working with the family for they can uh, determine what sort of scope of the recognition they would prefer. And that's a, a collaborative process that will involve uh, the lead of, of parks and facility staff. And they've been in contact uh, with planning staff. And uh, following this report going to council, they would take the lead on the actual implementation of any commemoration. So that concludes the staff presentation on the Heyman family history and research. Staff are recommending that the report be received. If there is any further information that the committee has, uh, it can be provided to staff I can, at the point of contact. Uh, we are taking the uh, report to Committee of the Whole on March 8th, uh, so next Tuesday. So any additional information that might be found ideally is, uh, would be, be provided in short order just so we can ensure we incorporate it into our report. That concludes my staff presentation, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Okay, any questions for Patrick? 
No, Patrick did a very good thorough job there. Good job. Oh, wait, Council Law has a question. Come on. I think I'm going to pass up an opportunity to talk to Patrick. Okay. So thank you for that report. That was, uh, I just love this stuff. Like I really do. Just, it's so great to hear about people like this. Like I just, I didn't know anything about these people until right now. And I'm curious about the naming convention. So obviously there is an extensively long list of how, of who we're gonna name, whatever. You mentioned benches. I'm curious what other options are there. Um, is there a list somewhere that could be found? And then is it within the mandate of this committee to just go about and do it? Uh, so through the chair, the the policy, uh, the, the corporate name, the policy on uh, naming building structures and parks sets out the nature of the program and it assigns the primary responsibility to uh, what is now the parks and facilities department the memorial bench uh, tree and plaque those are those are three different options you can hurt uh, you can have a, a bench with a plaque you can uh, have a plaque added to an existing bench uh, a new tree can be planted on a trail or within a park with a plaque sort of on a, a rock i think is what was communicated to me uh, as the the most common uh, process, but that is usually something that is done by parks and facilities working directly with a potential applicant. Someone who is interested in the commemoration can speak directly to that department and they will just work with, with the applicant. Is an art piece considered a structure? Uh, if it was public art, uh, that would be a structure that falls under the tourism mandate, but these plaques, these memorials are under the parks and facilities mandate. So they maintain them make sure that you know, they're not overgrown, um, they're, they're kept clean and, and visible. It's complex, eh? Okay, thank you. Uh, Bev. No. No, you're muted now, Bev, sorry. There you okay, go. Okay, better? Thanks. Um, I'm just wondering if there's any city owned facility that hosts uh, the playing of badminton within it, where there could be recognition to Edith of her contribution to the sport and it, that location be plaqued with a brief bio of her coaching and Olympic time. How difficult would that be? Uh, so through the chair, I would have to defer on something like that to the Parks and Facilities Department. I don't believe any staff were able to make it to tonight. Yeah, uh, It's something I can bring to their attention, but typically uh, the creation of a facility like that, if, it's, if one does not exist and is not commemorated, then it would have to go through the full capital process and would be part of a future project. So I, I wouldn't know if there is a badminton field or, or court, sorry, badminton court that could be dedicated at this time, I'd have to talk to them. Okay, yeah, I wasn't concerned about making this new. I was just wondering <laughs> if there was an existing facility that's uh, used quite often for badminton and if there could be some sort of recognition in that location. Not a huge endeavor, but just... Uh... Yeah, I think they're... Uh... A lot of the badmintons are probably in general generic gym, gymnasiums. Um, Councilor Wall, you have your hand up. Yeah, I want to roll with that idea that Bev said. Is it within our mandate to be able to make a request to our facilities department to see if there's an unnamed badminton court somewhere on a city property? We could just, as a start, do something like that. Like, how would we? Like, the rescue center might have a badminton court. I wish I played badminton now. I don't, I don't know where to find one of those things. That's the one with the birdie, right? Yeah. There you go. Look at that badminton expert wall over here. There's got to be one of those somewhere. Um, sorry, Patrick, my question is directly to you. Could we put out a request to our facilities manager and say, hey, is there a badminton court somewhere that we could put something up to commemorate? Uh, so through the chair, and I see my, my manager has also uh, turned on his camera, so I'll also let once I'm done answering, I will turn it over to him to add anything. Uh, so the only, sorry, the only thing I would add is that every room at City Hall is named after a neighborhood 
in the great city of Brantford. Um, I can't see any reason why we, we already have a naming policy for rooms. So perhaps like a badminton court is technically a, okay. I think I, everyone understands <laughs> what Councilor Wall is trying to say here. I'm going to stop talking. Al. <laughs> Thank you. Good, after, good evening, everyone, through the chair. Um, I just wanted to add to what Patrick was saying. You know, we don't know if there's a, a dedicated uh, badminton facility in the city, um, but we can find out. Um, as Nathan said, you know, it's, it's likely that badminton's just played in, in gymnasiums across the city, but we can ask our, our, our Parks and Rec staff if, uh, if there is something that uh, you know, lend itself to potentially being uh, a, a venue that uh, could recognize Edith Heyman, given her, uh, you know, her significance to, to the sport of badminton. Um, and uh, we could try to get that answer before we, um, before we take the report to the March 8th committee on this matter and, and have that answer available at that time. Thanks, Alan. Um, Susan, did you have your hand up? Yeah, I uh, threw the chair. I just um, went on Google and Brantford has a badminton club on 627 Colburn Street East. And I believe Edith Heyman was, the, well, maybe not a founding member, but she was the significant mover and shaker of the Brantford Badminton Club. So, okay, that's good, good information. Uh, Councillor McCurry, you had your hand up there. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, Patrick, perhaps you could check with um, staff at the Gretzky Center Sports Hall of Fame and see if she's recognized there. And also the Sport Council, Mr. Uh, Harding, I think is still the, uh, the lead on that. Uh, they do give awards every year and I know some of them are historic in nature and perhaps She's been recognized there as well. Okay. Yeah, and so through the chair, so the, Edith Heyman is recognized in the Sports Hall of Recognition. It was that basis that her name was added to the street name list to, to and that was part of the, the formal update to the street name list was including posthumous honors from those who are recognized in the Sports Hall. So, so that is included there. Okay. Uh, so, we uh, would need a mover and a seconder that the report be received. Moved by Tamara, seconded by, oh, I got too many hands there, Dan Brown. Uh, any other discussion or comments on receiving this report? Hearing none, I'll call the question. All those in favor? Thank you, hands down. I declare it carried. Um, we will now move on to item 5.4, which is part two, phase B of the properties recommended for this. And I'll turn it over to Patrick. Thank you, Chair. One moment, I'll start my uh, staff presentation. And so, this presentation discusses the um, latest phase, phase B. Uh, this is the uh, priority group B properties that were identified uh, through part one of the Heritage Register project, but were not uh, listed in August of 2020. These are the properties that are going through the city in geographic phases. Uh, so just a, a quick refresher for the Heritage Committee, though I'm sure everyone is quite familiar with the Heritage Register and how it functions. Um, we are required as a municipality to maintain a heritage register and it must include all the properties we designate. Um, it may include non-designated properties, which we uh, collective, like in, in the industry are typically called listed properties. Um, they have some cultural heritage value or interest, but it's not full designation. Uh, where these properties are added or removed, council has to consult with its heritage committee. Uh, and so just a quick comparison, a designated property is regulated. There's a bylaw passed by the council. That bylaw is registered on title. It sets out a list of heritage attributes. For a listed property, um, there is, uh, through the notice 
a reason why the municipality believes the property has heritage value, but there's no legal document registered on title. There's no bylaw passed by uh, the council. For designated properties, the uh, city has a 90 day time frame to review any demolition permits or to uh, review any uh, heritage alteration. So the heritage permit process here in Brantford. For a listed property, uh, the city has 60 days, but that is only for the review of a notice of intention to demolish. There's no formal approval or denial mechanism with that notice. It's just, just a 60 day sort of uh, discussion period uh, between the city and the individual providing that notice. After that 60 days, uh, the demolition permit process can proceed as normal under the building code, but councils can then choose a method of conservation. So uh, whether it's going through the full designation process or trying to work with the, the property owner. A heritage permit is not required to alter or renovate a listed property if it's not designated. So part one of the Heritage Register project that started in 2017 and worked through to 2020. Uh, 832 properties were identified there for listing and uh, the first batch of 98 uh, Priority Group A properties were listed uh, after a council decision in August of 2020. These were the 98, the, the best examples of, of non-designated historic properties in the city. Uh, as a result of the conclusion of part one, staff were directed to proceed with part two. So uh, through that, we divided the city into phases and council uh, will consider sort of a, a batch of properties by geographic area. And that's first uh, the first phase, part, uh, part two, phase A, uh, concluded in November uh, with council's decision to list properties. That was in 2021. And now we're proceeding through the remaining phases, which we anticipate including in 2023. And that's partially because of the uh, municipal election process. Each phase will consist of consultation with property owners. Uh, so in phase B, uh, uh, there were 108 properties identified uh, in what is the phase B portion of Central Ward and East Ward South. So the red arrow just identifies uh, area 20 and, and phase B specifically. Given the number of properties that were in that city area 20, uh, it was just felt that that would be too many properties to bring uh, to council at one time and might limit the amount of public consultation. So in order to really have effective consultation with property owners, uh, the area was split in half. So approximately 100 properties going in each, each phase. And then after consultation with the Heritage Committee, um, the southern portion was uh, phase B. Due to the high number of properties in Eagle Place, that would became phase C and the remainder of East Ward and, and Central Ward uh, is phase D. So we're just dealing with the area in green, uh, phase B. So the phase, the process in part two of the Heritage Register, uh, cities, the city's consultant, ASI, reviews demolition, building permit information, and they complete a windshield survey in that verified it confirms that there are no substantial physical changes to the property and just confirms the analysis that was done in part one a number of years ago still holds up as part of that process the notice is provided to property owners and we hold the virtual uh, due to covid virtual public information center in the case of phase b that public information center was on january 31st going through the review 97 properties uh, of the 108 are recommended to be added to the heritage register as non-designated listed properties. Of those 97, three objections were received prior to staff finalizing the report to this heritage committee meeting. Um, at the PIC, we also did have uh, at least two uh, members of the public uh, expressed uh, interest and, and appreciated that their property was being identified as one that merits listing. They, they liked that their, the history of their property was being recognized. So. Um, well, yes, there are some property owners who may have some concerns. We do get uh, property owners turning out and celebrating and, and enjoying that their property is being, being recognized. So of the properties that are not or no longer being recommended for listing, four properties had been altered um, in between their or original survey 
and the subsequent phase B windshield survey. So 427 to 433 Colburn Street, uh, significant facade changes and losses to the original uh, commercial entrances uh, resulted in a reevaluation. There were not enough uh, heritage, heritage attributes to support the, uh, the criteria. 240 Darling Street um, was identified as unique and the porch was replaced sometime between 2019 and 2021. Unfortunately, that was the um, largest driving factor, what, what really made that property stand out as a property with sufficient integrity, that really it represented a, a high quality historic property, so it was dropped under the methodology that was developed. Uh, the other two properties, 87 Park Avenue, similarly, the original porch structure was removed. Uh, when the windshield survey was being conducted, it wasn't clear uh, what sort of renovation or alteration was being done to replace the porch. So at this time, it's not being recommended as, again, it lost a significant heritage attribute. And 489 Colburn Street, uh, unfortunately, a fire occurred and caused a significant amount of damage, including uh, damaging some of the decorative trim and uh, to building. Uh, it's not clear if it can be restored or saved or if it is uh, slated for demolition. Additionally, four properties were reevaluated, and it was determined that they were rated um, higher than they would have been or a comparable property would have been. Uh, those four properties are 130 Park Avenue, 242 Darling Street, 127 East Avenue, and 96 Park Avenue. And so those properties, because they don't meet the um, established procedures, don't, uh, don't warrant listing under the procedure that was established in the project. And lastly, there were three additional properties. They no longer met sufficient numbers of criteria. Uh, all of these properties were um, believed to predate the incorporation of the city of Brantford. But on closer review, that dating based on their architectural style couldn't be confirmed. And so where it didn't apply, they did not meet enough other criteria to meet the project methodology. And in some cases we do see a lower integrity the original features don't remain. And so the, they're not exceptional quality. They might, if they were exceptional, had a lot of their original architectural details or heritage attributes and just no longer predated incorporation, they might've still warranted that listing. But, but based on their lower integrity, loss of original features, and now later believed the uh, date of construction did no longer meet the project criteria as, as um, High, you know, high quality examples that warrant listing. Um, of the properties that are recommended to be listed, uh, three objections were received from property owners. Uh, the objections were for 70 Alfred Street, uh, 119 Park Avenue, and 29 Murray Street. Staff uh, considered the objections, They've, we've attached them to the report for the committee, uh, but staff is of the opinion that each of these three properties um, meet sufficient criteria and still warrant inclusion on the city's heritage register. Uh, they all they all retain historic uh, heritage attributes, historic design features and details, and they're all of sufficient quality that they merit listing. So staff is providing that information to council for council to make its decision. And staff is of the opinion though that the properties do warrant that listing and that that recognition of their their history. Uh, so that concludes my staff presentation. Uh, staff is providing the committee with an option to provide comments, and those comments will be included in staff's future report to the Committee of the Whole on March 8th. That concludes my staff presentation, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Any questions for Patrick? I see hands already up. Council Wall, go ahead. So no questions, because that was a very comprehensive and incredible report, and I don't have questions. I do have commentary to add, though, when the time is appropriate, Mr. Charles. Oh, okay. Sure. No? Uh, no, well, I just want to check Councilor McCurry. You don't have any questions for Patrick? Oh, Dan, you muted yourself again. We can't hear you, sorry. I'll be glad when we're back in person, Mr. Chair. Um, yeah. Let's hope we can do that next month once the restriction. You're here. No, sorry. Our, we still restrict 
uh, committee members from coming to meetings, don't we, guys? Yeah, okay. Um, perhaps maybe the month after. Uh, Patrick, the three properties for which objections were noted, they remain on the list, correct? For this year, that is correct. And it would seem that two of them don't quite understand what it's all about, and perhaps the other one um, uh, should pay more attention to the to the uh, quality and uh, upkeep of their building by the comments that were expressed. Thank you for that. Okay. Any other questions for Patrick before we go to comments? No? Okay. Thank you, Patrick. Councillor Wall, you have a comment. Yeah. I mean, I speak for myself and not the entire committee unless the committee supports what I say. So my comments are simple. Um, the fact that so many properties went from where they were to where they are in such a short period of time just proves how important it is that we get this done because every single day heritage and historical buildings in this community are losing what is making them historic or worthy of this and i just think that more and more property owners who are purchasing homes like this are purchasing them because of that. And if they knew that they were buying a property that was designated or registered, they might take more effort into preserving the things that make them significant. So I guess the short form of that would be, let's get it done, but more so. Um, this report, just the fact that there were so many properties that went from being like recognized to not, just shows how important this report is. And I, I don't know, it's kind of self-appreciating, but that's my comments. Okay. Um, so we need a mover and a seconder for comments. If we're, if we're going to add uh, in a comment like Councillor Walls that this highlights the importance of the project. Uh, Rob, are you making that motion? Yeah, and Councillor McGarry, you're seconding? Perfect. Um, so we have Councillor Wall's comment. Uh, any other comments wish to be registered? Rob, go ahead. I would I would support uh, staff's uh, recommendation that the three properties that received objection still go forward for inclusion on the uh, heritage register and encourage council to support that. Thank you, Rob. That was also going to be part of my comment. So thank you, Rob. Uh, any, any other comments? Bev? It just, I was very disappointed reading the letter uh, from the person who had been retained to object to being on the list for 70 uh, Alfred, because that's a substantial house. It uh, sits very nicely on the corner. Both houses that are a kitty corner and across are very nicely kept. I drive down that street regularly and it's been very apparent that the current owner has been neglecting the property. So I didn't feel much empathy when they were stating how the tenants had caused uh, issues in the building and it was across the street from the clinic so there were issues there but uh, the clinic has moved a bit so it's a, a as I said a substantial house that should be kept in the neighborhood okay. just want to voice that that don't so want to see that in the last yeah so I think uh, we had a specific clause there. Uh, the third comment would be 70 Alfred Street is a significant property to incorporate Bob's suggestion. So we have three comments. Um, any Anyone else? Okay, seeing none, everyone's clear on the three comments that we're voting on. Yeah, okay, then I'll call the question. All those in favor? Thank you, hands down, I declare it carried. All right, we're getting there. Consent items, so we have minutes. So uh, 
any errors or omission in the minutes? And if not, then can I get a mover and a seconder for the minutes? Susan, seconded by Tamara. Anyone have any concerns they need to highlight? No? Seeing none, I'll call the question. All those in favor? Thank you. Hands down, I declare that carry. Uh, there are no subcommittee updates, no resolutions. And before adjournment, I need to ask Patrick for a comment about 2C of our heritage register since we just finished talking about 2B. Thank you, Chair. Uh, we just want to let the Heritage Committee know that the next uh, public information center for uh, phase 2C is on March 7th. Uh, it'll run from 6 to 8 p.m. It'll, it'll function just like the previous phase uh, public information centers. I will uh, share a link with the committee members via email to the uh, posting on our council and committee calendar webpage. That will let all the committee members who are interested in attending and watching that PIC do so. Uh, and then like the previous PIC, we will post that video. We will record it. We'll post it to our YouTube page after the fact. So if anyone can't make it and would like to see it, uh, everyone will have that option. But so again, Monday, March 7th from 6 to 8 p.m. Uh, via Zoom. Um, and then just for committee's information, so that PIC, we will target a report much like the one you just heard to the March 28th uh, meeting of Brantford Heritage Committee. Uh, and then it will go to Committee of the Whole Planning and Administration on April 12th for a decision on phase C by the end of April. Great, thanks for that update. Seems like our project is moving along uh, great here. So thank you for that. Uh, so now I need a motion to adjourn. Tamara, thank you. We could just hang hey. out. Guys Hope everyone cool. has a good month and uh, we're, we're getting closer to meeting back together in person, which will have a much better dynamic, I'm sure. Okay, thank you everyone for a great evening.